Hey everyone, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. In this daily editorial, we are introducing a new energy company to all of you, recommended to us by our good friend Dan Steffens, president of the Energy Prospectus Group. Dan introduced us to Colibri Global Energy, traded on the TSX under the symbol KEI, and also on the NASDAQ under the symbol KGEI. That NASDAQ listing, new as of October last year. Dan wanted us to note that this company is part of his small cap growth portfolio. Colibri Energy focused in Oklahoma in the Southern Scoop region. We are chatting with the president and CEO, Wolf Reginer. Now, Wolf, let's just start off with a quick overview of the company in terms of positioning within the oil sector. Give us an understanding of in terms of production and in terms of growth plans, where Colibri is positioned, please. Okay, happy to. Thanks for having me on. We are in Oklahoma. We're about halfway between Dallas and Oklahoma City, We're right outside of Ardmore, and we're mainly a oil producer out of the shale here. We used to develop the deeper Woodford that we sold to Exxon back in 2013 and kept the rights to the shallower Caney, and we're the only ones that did that. They accumulated about 280,000 acres around us, by the way. So we were the last holdout and held on to the shallower Caney, which is much, much oilier. So we produce about, third quarter was about 76% oil, another 14% natural gas liquids, and about 10% was natural gas. So natural gas prices up or down uh, doesn't move the me- needle too much for us. Uh, we get nice solid pricing, no big differentials, about a dollar eighty-five less uh, West Texas intermediate pricing. And all of our gas and natural gas liquids gets moved off of existing gathering systems that are out here that actually Exxon has. So we get the same pricing that they get from their marketing department, and we just pay them a compression and a gathering fee. Um, And overall, what distinguishes us a little bit is our reserves are approved reserves of 33 million uh, BOEs. About 82% of that is still in the approved undeveloped category, and about 18% is in the approved developed producing category. Uh, This is for the end of 2022's reserve report. The new one's coming out in uh, here in the next few weeks for the end of 2023. And just from 2021 to 2022, we increased about 10% in our PDPs. So as we're completing more and more wells, bringing those into the approved developed producing category from the low risk reserves, according to Netherlands Sewell, who does our reserve engineering, so a reputable firm out of the US, then hopefully uh, that'll be demonstrated into our share price as well. Well, Wolf, let's talk on that string for a second and just talk about that because you have a lot of opportunity to jump categories and bring more into the Prove developed and producing category as you drill more wells. Could you just walk us through how many wells are producing right now? And I know you did some new wells in Q4 of last year. Maybe mention those and then what you have on tap for new growth for this year. Yeah, so uh, happy to. So uh, reserve report from Netherlands Sewell showed at the end of 2022, 60 proved locations that we can still drill in the future. And we have a total of about 180 locations out here in the proved probable and possible category, plus some acreage that we have not uh, put any caney wells into, so they have not evaluated it at all on that for future growth in general. Um, Our plans, yeah, we brought some wells on, three wells on in the end of uh, fourth quarter, so they had a little bit of impact, but not much of an impact in fourth quarter. So you'll see production up higher in general for us. Third quarter production was about 2,700 BOE a day, and early January, we're producing about 3,800 BOE a day. Uh, We're looking to drill another uh, and complete another two wells here in the second quarter. Uh, Hopefully early in the quarter, we'll start drilling those and then complete them during the second quarter. And then uh, we'll be looking to bring on a total of five wells in uh, late third quarter, maybe early fourth quarter of this year as well. So more drilling, more growth. At the same time, that's just from this field, and we're also looking at uh, potential other projects to have us grow. Because I think we're doing a good job. We're getting more and more efficient at everything we do. And uh, that's what we're looking to apply to uh, this project and other projects as well. 
Alyssa, do you have any guidance that you can share with us in terms of actual BOE per day through the first half of this year, even how you're going to end this year, 2024? Yeah, so um, I, I try to stay away from uh, exit rates just because they could be misleading if we bring production on either earlier or later near the end of the year. But generally, uh, we're looking for an average production of about 3,500 to 4,000 BOE a day. And uh, that's up drastically over the years. That's about a 25 to 33% increase over what our guidance was for 2023. And our financials aren't out yet. That's why I have to still refer to 2023 as guidance. Uh, but we're looking to uh, just continue the growth that we've uh, had out here. So a few years ago in 2021, our adjusted EBITDA in US dollars was only about 6.6 .6 million. In 2022, we were up to 25 million, so a huge jump. 2023 forecast is 39 to 41 million. Again, a nice growth increase, and we're looking to continue that in 2024 to 46 to 51 million. Well, Wolf, you can tell that with all that growth that you're generating more cash flows now, that does give the company more optionality to do some different things. We were talking off mic before starting today, and you mentioned that there's some initiatives the company could do to start returning more value to shareholders with some of that optionality in the cash flows, but also work on the debt. So maybe balance out how the growth in production can also equal some growth in the financial side of the business. Absolutely. So <clears throat> cash flow basically gives you options, right? <laughs> so cash flow is good. Um, we try to keep our net debt down. We have a uh, line of credit with the Bank of Oklahoma uh, for $40 million. And our net debt at the end of this year is expecting to be somewhere between 25 and 27 million. So we're keeping our debt down low. Our CapEx, we're estimating to be between 33 and 39 million. So that gives us a nice cushion uh, where we should have extra cash flow. And so uh, the board on a quarterly basis is considering implementation and implementation of shareholder returns and what form that'll be in will be up to the board decision. I'll probably more lean toward early on uh, recommending some share buybacks, uh, especially if we're still quite undervalued in what we consider out here uh, before we go to dividends, but uh, those could be in the future as well. And that'll be, like I said, a, a board decision for later on this year. Our forecasts are also using a $72 oil price, which is nice to see right now that we're hovering around 80. Uh, so that always helps cash flow as well. So as the company focuses on some of the growth, it sounds like slow and steady growth for this year. How do you go about maintaining these higher operating net backs? So we are fortunate that we are quite efficient in what we do. And we're fortunate that our field does not produce a whole lot of water. So we have really quite low operating expenses. When we look at what third quarter was, it was just over $7 a barrel of oil equivalent on our operating expenses out here. So what a total cost of getting the oil out of the ground. And also the higher pricing, since we're in the heart of Oklahoma, uh, I mentioned that we get WTI, West Texas Intermediate pricing, less about $1.85. So that le leads to high netbacks for us, uh, you know, efficiencies in operation and good pricing without differential swinging all over the place, which I know happens in some areas. Uh, so our netbacks in third quarter uh, from the field were about $43 a barrel of oil equivalent. Well, considering some of those operational advantages, if you were to expand by growing through acquisition or purchasing properties, would you stick with Oklahoma then for some of those advantages or would you be looking further afield? What would an acquisition look like? We're fairly agnostic to where we're looking. You know, the easiest would be right next door to us in Oklahoma, obviously, um, mid-continent, but we'll look elsewhere. It just has to be something that's accretive for the shareholders. We're all shareholders and that's what we really look out for. Uh, we're trying to run our business in the best way, in the best fashion possible. And so anything that we do uh, needs to be accretive. And so, you know, where we are pricing right now, we think we're quite undervalued still. It would be harder to do an accretive transaction tomorrow. But hopefully as we're drilling and growing the company, share price kind of catches up. We could use a combination of debt and equity at some point in time, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, we want to keep debt in a reasonable level. But when you're bringing on new assets as well, then you've got the uh, base to... Uh, loan against or borrow against as well while keeping your debt reasonable. 
the wolf. Let's talk a little bit about the team at Colibri then. Give us a little background on yourself and highlight maybe one or two other management, key management members, please. Sure. Happy to. So I've got over 36 years of uh, oil and gas experience, both in conventional and unconventional in multiple different companies. Uh, I've done everything from land work to extensive operations experience to uh, finance experience in general. Uh, just a big overall <laughs> oil and gas, uh, everything from heavy oil, natural gas to uh, shale gas and shale oil. Gary Johnson uh, has over 30 years of accounting and finance experience. He is ex-Occidental Petroleum. He was their director of technical accounting. So he's been great as our CFO. And our two other main people were, we've got a director of engineering that we brought on recently, who has worldwide experience uh, on operations, reservoirs uh, all across the U.S. and internationally, actually, uh, for more than 30 years. And Alan Hemi, our geologist. Uh, who has been with us for 12, 15 years here now um, on this project itself and uh, just a all good team. I've done a great job of uh, getting efficiencies better and better and making better frack jobs and, you know, drilling wells better. I mentioned earlier that our efficiencies that we look at, we came into 2023 with a well cost all in producing through hookup of 7.2 million U.S., and our last two wells we drilled in 2023 were down to about 5.4 million U.S. through different efficiencies and just trying new things and trying to get better and better at what we do. Constant improvement is the name of the game. And our team is what that what looks for that. Well, Wolf, on the theme of constant improvement, there seems like there's a lot of growth on tap for the company as far as production, cash flows, optionality with those cash flows. But Let's talk about the financial share structure, how you're valued in the marketplace, and maybe contrast it with, some, I guess, a peer comparison, whatever elements you want to highlight of why you think you're so undervalued and where the room for the re-rating could be. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, it's getting noticed. Excuse me. So um, we just uplisted to the NASDAQ in October of last year, and we're doing some more marketing this year in the U.S., we got our name out there because we're really not that well known. Um, and so I think we're completely underfollowed in where we are. I think we are trading when we look at a proved asset value. Um, we're trading at about half of what a number of our peers, uh, our Canadian peers, I'll say. Because if you look at the reserve reports, uh, we're TSX listed. And so we do uh, the reserve reports that are up to uh, Canadian standards. And so we compare ourselves to the Canadian side of things, and people can find that on our website where we compare ourselves to uh, a number of other Canadian uh, peers where we stack up quite well, where the average trades at about 44% of the net asset value. And uh, we're trading at about uh, 20, 22% of that on a proved in net asset value, I should say based on everyone's third-party engineering reports. So as we drill more, we get more attention. People realize that we can convert all these proved reserves into proved developed producing. Um, that gap should start narrowing. All right. Well, thank you for this update. We'll post a link to the Colbury website so that people can go through some of those slides. The corporate presentation, learn more about the company. And we'll follow along when the company releases the Q4 results and also any other news that comes out this year as, well, you continue to drill and generate cash flow in a generally better oil environment. As we're chatting now, oil, again, being back over $80 a barrel. Wolf, thank you very much for your time. Please keep us up to date on future news and financial results. Will do. Thank you for having me.